right, guys, welcome back. Uh, this is podcast number 59. Um, I've got a special guest again with me. A couple podcasts ago, I don't know if it was our last one or the one before, um, we had Lillian in on it with us. Um, she was not feeling good. It was a couple weeks ago. Um, and so she kind of sat in with us and, and added her two cents. Uh, she's with us again today. We are, so if you do hear some noises in the background, um, if we end up having to cut it, I think we cut it once last time when we had her here because it just, it just was getting a little bit rough. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to see how she does. She's having, she's on lunch hour right now. So she's eating some chicken and drinking milk and sitting literally with Ben and I here at the table. Um, she's home because uh, we're going through some interesting times. Obviously, everybody is aware, and we, we release these pretty quickly after we record them. Um, interesting times right now. Uh, unprecedented, I guess. Uncharted waters. So, um, kids are home from school for a couple weeks. Um, we are do practicing, I think they call it social distancing. Um, ben, scoot over a little bit. You're within my comfort zone. In the uh, but we, are, we have enhanced our... Um, protocol here as most places have we washing our hands more we're paying attention to spacing out and and quite honestly um it's not the worst habit probably to get in going forward so we're not going to talk much about that today specifically um but it is such a big in our face type thing it's hard not to um, relate to it these days in some way or fashion. So um, this is a podcast. This podcast we're going to talk about today is not going to be based off of any questions, although I have been stacking many of those up and we'll be getting to those. Um, we have the last several podcasts have been driven off of Facebook and Instagram and maybe even a little bit of YouTube um, feedback and interaction that we have. Obviously, we've got a lot of projects going still. Our Bella Be Good continues to roll out. If you are not less, if you are not watching or subscribe to our YouTube, I recommend you do it it's at Dogbone Hunter. Um, ben has been doing a good job of continually posting um, new episodes of Bella Be Good. I have fallen behind a bit with the promos. That doesn't just because you're not seeing the promos on Instagram and Facebook doesn't mean new episodes aren't coming out. They are. I'm actually three or four behind right now. So if you are uh, into the Bella Be Good series, um, I would make sure you subscribe and turn your notifications on. Uh, you'll get notified on you through email, I think is how it's set up, it, depending on how you have your YouTube account set up, but it'll let you know when a new episode goes and Ben is continually doing those. We're still out about 15 probably um, that we've recorded ahead of what we've actually prom uh, posted or, or made live on the YouTube channel. So <clears throat> that is something that's ongoing. Um, we've got another series that I'm very excited about um, that's going to start soon, uh, maybe probably this week even. Um, it's probably, in my opinion, one of the most valuable things we've done, um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but that's going to be starting. That's a YouTube. That's going to be a YouTube series and Facebook. We're going to put that one on Facebook. Um, so if you're following us on the different social channels, you'll hit it, see it in different spots. But that one will play the full episodes on Facebook, which some of them are up to 20, 30 minutes long. Um, some are shorter, like 7 to 10 minutes. But um, I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is I want to share a story with you. Uh, I feel like Mr. Rogers a little bit. I just watched that movie and he, I liked it. Uh, I thought it was awesome. Um, the guy was super interesting. I loved his patience. Um, and he slowed everything down around him. And this isn't what the story is about, but it, I just bring it up because we just literally watched that movie not too long ago. I recommend it if you um, haven't seen it. But it was really an interesting story, um, true story, obviously. And the pace that he carried made those around him comfortable. And I think we can take something from that as a dog trainer. I think we can also take it um, something from it as just a human being. Um, I think these times that are a little stressful, um, creating issues, I think you know, in society right now, there's some panic probably is a good way of describing it. Um, but there's also, I look at it as a really good chance and opportunity to slow down and realize, be aware of what's around us, 
understand that, yeah, you gotta be concerned with it, but we're not gonna just freak out. Um, we've talked a lot about it at work here with our guys. Um, we've had to because we have to deal with it. We're a small, small company, um, but there's five, six guys and girls that are working with us, um, not all full time, but there's five or six of us that rotate in and out and help keep the thing keep things moving here, and we have to discuss it. We have to be sure we're all on the same page. And um, and part of what we're doing is, from a business standpoint, I don't know that we're changing that much. Um, it's business as usual for us because we are so small, but. There's a lot of people around us that are being impacted and we need to be conscious of it. We need to be compassionate about it. We have to have understanding. Uh, our kids are gonna be coming home from school. Um, I look at that as really a little bit of a blessing. And I say that and some people are rolling their eyes going, you're an idiot. And I'm going, yeah, maybe a little bit, but I, I get to take care of Lillian for if not all day, part of the day. I get to see our kids at home when I normally wouldn't because they're at school and we're working. And we get into such a fast pace and have all this stuff to do. The thing is, is it all has to get done and it all will get done. It's just a matter of when and how quickly. And there's this springtime is always a reminder of it um, because sometimes we have early springs and sometimes we have late springs. Sometimes we get winter, you know, snowstorms in May. Um, and and the, who knows, we might get that yet too. But is as things happen in, in nature, um, everything gets done. And there's this, this quote that it's, I don't, I don't have it verbatim, but something about nature never rushes yet. Everything is accomplished. And when you think about that, it's true. Like you, you never see nature rushing. You never see nature panicking. You never see things freaking out because of something that came up, yet things are coming up constantly out there. Um, this is just something, this whole Corona thing. It's just something. And everything's gonna get done. Within our company, everything's gonna get done. Within our family, everything's gonna get done. With our, our kids' education, everything is gonna get done. We're all gonna eat. We're all gonna get toilet, enough toilet paper to make it through. Like, you can laugh about some of this stuff, but it, some of it's pretty serious. And I think the reality is, is if we just take it and put it into perspective and handle it appropriately, we're gonna be just fine. Now, I went and I took a course not too long ago. Um, I went to a blacksmithing class. It was a um, gift the, and, and, and I kicked around this topic for the podcast for a couple of weeks now because I wanted it to be just perfect. Um, I thought about it, I took some notes on it. I didn't take as many notes on it as I wish I had because I'd get random ideas and thoughts that would come up in my head and I wish I would have noted them all. It, some of them I did, but I wanted this, po I thought this podcast was, this idea for this podcast was just brilliant. And, and I say that with a little bit of sarcasm, but I thought it was a real good analogy to some of the dog stuff that I relate to and others relate to with us and in particular workshops. Um, but so I signed up, uh, I didn't sign up. We, it was a gift for Steph and I for Christmas. And we went and we did a blacksmithing course where this guy has this little blacksmith shop and he does blacksmithing and he brings people in on the weekend and it's at eight, like eight hours and you learn how to do it. And it's this ancient old craft and it, it was really cool and I was kind of excited about it. I was a little intimidated by the idea of it. I've never done anything like that. Um, so it was totally new to me, 100%. I had no idea what I was getting into. Really didn't know the concept behind it, didn't know any of the ideas behind it. Just knew that, you know, the cartoon where there's a big anvil and a red hot steel and they pound on it. That was about my extent of understanding blacksmithing. So when we went there, this guy introduces himself and he's old school. He's got big handlebar mustache, um, bandana. Um, is she playing with her bottle? Yeah. Um, so we walk in and this guy is like kind of like a page out of the history books. Um, you know, it's, it's an ancient craft. And, and so he's got this office that's full of like things that are made that he has made. He does it for a living. So he's doing like ornamental stuff for different people. It's all like unique. Everything he builds is one of a kind. Basically he can replicate stuff pretty closely, but no two things are the same. And so this, we walk into it and we're looking at this little studio that he has 
And we're looking at all these things and we realize that we have the opportunity, we're gonna have an opportunity to build something by the end of this class. Um, but he introduces himself, he gets us in there, he gets the rest of the class in, it's a relatively small group, but varying from like an older guy to um, Steph being a younger gal, myself being in the middle, uh, my father-in-law was there, um, his girlfriend was there. So it was, in, in, it was just, it was a mixed, mixed group of people. Um, there was a guy younger than us that's actually um, Steph's dad's girlfriend's son. So like, you know, follow that family tree. But so he was there, he had some experience with blacksmithing before. So, um, you know, he was way ahead of everybody else. And so it was just a real interesting dynamic as far as the group and the background and history of who the people that were there. And then we come in, so I'm uncomfortable to begin with. I'm starting to see, he's taking us through it and he's talking about, we're going to make hooks. And so that's how you make a hook and you practice making hooks and you, there's a couple different techniques. You got to twist the steel, you got to flatten it. You got to make a different type of point. You got to put some bends in it. You, there's, there's just, if we, when you think about a hook, it's a very simple thing, but there's lots of little variations. And ironically to build a hook, you got to do just about every little thing that you get a taste of blacksmithing, like the different techniques, the different, the different steps to build a hook cover just about everything you need to build just about anything. All ironically, blacksmithing is really simple. Um, the big picture of it, the scope of it is super simplified. It's you heat metal up, you shape it, you mold it, you turn it into something else. Um, there's just like anything else. There's a lot of technical parts to it. There's a lot of things about staying square and making sure that you always correct it to be right and straightened out and level and otherwise it gets too loose and if it gets too loose and it gets too bent and crooked and then you're repairing more than you're building and so it's just it's this idea of the words the guy used that I thought were brilliant was he said we coax and correct that's all we do as a as a blacksmith we coax the metal and then we make the corrections and so we coax it and correct it and he said one of the things that we need to do is we need to always be looking three steps ahead so when we get into this we're going to look at you know what the finished product's going to be where you're starting which is just a flat stick of steel or whatever it is that you're using for raw material and then what's three steps down the road and what's beyond that and what, how are you gonna to get to that third step? And that takes step one and then step two and then step three. And then by the time you're to step three, you're thinking about step six because it's three steps down the road. So this guy was painting this vision to us of you coax and correct the steel. It's a process, you heat it up and then you work on it. You heat it up and you work on it. And what's interesting is, is when you heat it up and take it out, you only have so long. You only have so long between when it becomes workable to when it becomes not workable. And what do you do when it becomes not workable? Put it back in the stove, put it back in the little heater thing and it heats it back up and then you take it back out. Well, there's downtime in there. So when it's in the little stove, you're thinking about what your next move is because when you take it out, if you're dilly dallying thinking, what am I gonna do now? You just ran out of your opportunity to change the metal because it cools off. So it's a real methodical thing that goes on and on and on but it's really, it, what, uh, some of the things that really stood out to me were, first off, I was super uncomfortable when I got there. The guy made me instantly comfortable because he basically took the edge off and said, look, I asked some questions and he said, look, a lot of his answers were, well, that's kind of up to you. Now, there's principles that I couldn't just be up to me. There was ideas of you heat it to a certain point, it looks a certain color, you hit it a certain way, there's a technique and a form, there is a, a clear mechanical way to do it correctly, or you waste your energy, you waste the opportunity to actually change the metal, um, you just, it, there's things that you, it won't turn out well if you do it, if you don't do, follow simple mechanical procedures that are like standard blacksmithing stuff. But I said to him something about, you know, I'm making this coat hook. Well, I, I started bending it and I bent it the wrong way, basically. I bent, I basically, instead of curl, making a curl and curling it in, I curled it out. And so I didn't recognize it and realize it until I was like halfway into it. And I went, oh man, I looked at the example I was supposed to be replicating and I went, mine's the opposite. Now, it still was functional. 
it still is gonna work. Like, it's still a hook shape. It still would be able to put something on. It's just the curl went out instead of in. And so I showed it to the guy and I, and I was a little embarrassed by it. And I, you know, should I, should I start over? Should I try to correct this? And he looked at me and he said, well, you could, you could do all of that or you can look at it and go, will it work? And, and I guess I, look, I looked at it at that point and I said, yeah, it'll work. It's just, it's not right. It's not the same. And he goes, well, it's not right depending on what's your definition of right. He said, you know, you're the artist. It's got to be, it's got to be right to you, not necessarily to me. And I said, in this scenario, that's really true. I, I didn't realize that. But I thought I have to replicate exactly what this guy is doing because he's the teacher and he's the blacksmith guy. And I realized real quickly, there's a little bit of freedom in this and it's t what suits my needs. So as long as the hook works, really doesn't matter if it's curled in or curled out. Not really, we got a dog scratching on the bed down there. Lay down, good dog. So what was interesting was his attitude was what's important is how you feel about it as an artist. And, and so I went, well, I kind of like this freedom a little bit because there are some things that I can take the liberty of and then there's some things that I got to follow the rules and I got to follow the rules and making sure that I keep it square. And when I, when I say keep it square, I mean like as I pounded on this thing, it would start to bend and cool differently. And then I, before I put it back in the stove to heat it back up, he said, you always got to straighten that back out, correct that, fix that fix that before you put it back in and heat it back up because if you don't it's started to twist already the wrong way you go put it in the oven now it's going to get way hot it's going to get way twisted and you're going to come back out and you're going to lose the complete shape of it and so now you're going to have to reform it in the first place so it was this real understanding that i needed to have of how much to change it or try to change it and then regroup basically put it back in the stove but before you put it back in the stove, make sure you get it shaped properly so you can start out with good material the next time. And one of the things that I found out really quickly was my lack of patience showed really strongly in this process. Now, some people that are listening to this and some people that message me and email me go, man, you, you've got incredible patience. And they see one aspect of my life. They see me with a puppy or they see me with a dog. Or maybe they see me some of the stuff with our kids and family. But I'll be honest, you don't see it all. And I get pretty...
Uh, so we made these hooks and what I thought was interesting was I started thinking about the business end of it. This guy builds really high end stuff for homes and businesses and, and he, he just manufactures these things one at a time and it's time consuming but they're to me they're exactly what I want. They're unique. I love handmade stuff. I love handmade stuff that I made myself. I just got, this is a totally different tangent and we'll probably talk about this later, but we did maple syrup this weekend for the first time ever. And I think it's the best maple syrup that's ever been made in the world. It's because I made it. And it tastes like maple syrup. It's a little smokier than probably some. Depends if you like smoky or not. Some people might say it's too smoky for me. I don't like it. That's okay. I love it. It is maple syrup. It will go on a pancake. It will be very similar. It's very similar to other people's maple syrups, but it's just like wine. It's just like booze, like vodka or whiskey or bourbon or scotch. It's just like, it's like a lot of things in life. You can buy small handcrafted things. They're gonna cost more and they're gonna take more time to build. Or you can go and buy a bottle of Kessler's, and there's nothing wrong with Kessler's, but Kessler's is made, is made different than um, Blanton's. It's just different. It costs, costs less. One costs more than the other, and it all is directly related back to a lot of it has to go into what does it take to produce it? What are the ingredients? What are the raw materials? And so I look at this, and I look at dogs and dog training. Hey, little girl. Quit pounding. And I think about it, why don't you take that tray off and I'll hold on to her. And so, Ben here is babysitting for me. You gotta push those buttons. Yeah, there you go. And then you'll unbuckle that seat belt on her. And then I'll bring her over. And we'll see if we can have her settle in here a little bit to finish this up. But, so, when it comes to dogs, especially when it comes to training dogs, owning dogs, I think there's a lot of analogies to the blacksmithing thing. And part of it is, and, and I need to take away from that blacksmithing class and share some of the mentalities that that teacher had, because he was great. Uh, he made me feel comfortable. He made me feel like I could do it. He made me believe in the fact that I could build my fire poker. He let me make enough mistakes on my own. He didn't handhold me. He didn't come over and correct every little thing he did. I did. He let me make mistakes. And then he came over and offered help and he helped, offered to give me some advice. And when I did it well, he said, you did good. And when I didn't do it so good, he said, here's maybe what you should work on. So that guy did a great job of getting my level of comfort with blacksmithing capable of actually doing it. And so one of the things that I think the analogy is, is I hope to be kind of like that blacksmith guy for you with your dogs. And the thing, a couple of the things about it is, if you train your own dog, you're gonna do one at a time. That's how I do them. I got one client's dog in right now. I've got another one that's gonna be coming. You know, this one's, Bella's 11 months old, something like that. We're, we're going to train them one at a time because that's how I do it. I don't mass produce them. And so, and I don't have a problem with Menards. I don't have a problem with you. I buy a lot of coat hooks for a 24 pack for five bucks because it's cost effective for me in certain situations. But in certain situations, like our cabin where we wanted some coat hooks, they're gonna be a lot, I'm gonna enjoy them a whole lot more because we built six of them ourselves and they don't look the same. And if I had bought them, they would have cost me more, but I built it myself, so it saved some there. But we paid, you know, I, it was a gift, but the class was like, couple hundred bucks. So when you divide out the cost of those coat hooks, they got pretty expensive pretty quick. But it was the experience that we had doing it that was, I'm gonna say we got a good deal out of it because I enjoyed it that much. I had that much fun out of it. So there's a, so much relation to you guys training your dogs, me training my dogs. The value in it is the time that you put in, but the value in it is also the return you get out of it. My maple syrup tastes better than yours, I think, but it's partially because I made it. That's why I feel that way. It's partially because we spent eight hours cooking it 
and I smoked cigars and drank beer and relaxed and trimmed brush in the front yard and put wood on the fire and smelled like smoke and smelled like sap and like this whole experience I, I did it with my family and I had more fun doing that than I would ever have going to the store and buying a bottle of Aunt Jemima and I don't even do that anymore I, I mean we got some here that we bought from the maple syrup dude it's called this guy makes maple syrup and he sells it commercially and we bought a bottle of it and it tastes pretty good it tastes very close to what we what we made I think mine tastes better and it's not because, and maybe it doesn't, but I feel like it does because I have so much into it. I got eight hours of commitment into it, and I loved every minute of it. And every time I eat a pancake and have it, I'm gonna go, oh, remember that time we played that maple syrup song while we were watching this? I played it 10,000 times. Google it, Pete Seeger. It's called Maple Syrup Time. I played it a thousand times on Saturday because I just loved it. It's a story. The little song, he's a folk singer and he sang this story about making maple syrup. And that was part of my experience. And so each one of you guys have your own experience. And that's your dog, that's your puppy. That's your chance to enjoy the process rather than look at it as a chore. If, if maple syrup becomes too much work, if blacksmithing, if I hated the blacksmithing process, if I didn't make analogies to blacksmithing in my life, if I didn't think about blacksmithing for a week straight after, I have no desire to go blacksmithing and build a kiln or whatever you want to call that thing. He gave us, he gave us plans to build our own little oven thing. If we wanted to make our own, we could do it, he said. And he showed us how to do it. I have no desire to do it. I didn't love it that much. But I thought about it for a week straight after. And I thought more so about how it related to my, the rest of my life. Not so much building stuff out of steel. I will probably buy stuff from that guy because I have a story behind it now. I worked with him. He worked with me. He helped me. Hey, take it easy. But I will pay extra to get a gate made by him than I will go to get one at a store. And that's if I can afford it and it fits in our budget and all that stuff. But I just... I've got a whole new sense of value to things that are handmade when it comes to steel items. I have a whole sense of value to dogs that are trained without shop collars. I have a value for dogs that are trained by the owners themselves. I also see results that are better in my opinion. Now again, that comes back to you being the artist. I think it's a lot more impressive when someone trains their own dog and can take it and do stuff and enjoy it compared to sending them off. And maybe having that same type of control, no, don't touch that. And maybe not having that same type of control. Cause I see, look, I look at a lot of times when people send dogs off and they come back, I think they get good results. I rarely see great. And I think it's because there's the connection part of the process was missed. The training part is a process that is valuable. And if you don't do it, you don't get it. And I think what ends up happening is, is we create some of these dogs to be temporarily trained. And it's temporary and it fades. And then you get to the point as an owner where you go, I don't know how to fix it anymore because I didn't do it in the first place. So we send the dog back. And I don't have a problem with that. So I'm not knocking trainers. I'm not knocking kennels. I don't care about I, I I think it's a fit for certain people. But I also think the people that are listening to this podcast are probably not those people. The people that follow our stuff on social media are the people that are probably interested in doing it themselves. That's who I can help. I don't. You don't need my help if your plan is to send it off to a kennel. And I don't hold it against you if you do. What I do hold it against you is if you do it because you don't believe there's another way to do it. That's where I think it needs to be understood. There is a way to do it, you just have to understand it. I needed to go and learn how to do blacksmithing to realize that I don't wanna be a blacksmith. I'm not gonna be a blacksmith. I'll probably buy some stuff from a blacksmith though, because if I can afford it and I think there's a need for it, because I think it's cool. But I also think I say that and I go, someday I may have a little project that I need a certain thing 
and I might sign up for the class knowing that I already know how to do the basic stuff and he's got an advanced class and I may go, I want to go and build this one item because that's an item I'm going to look at every day and I want to know that I built it. I'm building a sauna right now out of an old 1800s log cabin. I could have went to Menards and bought two by fours, plywood, siding. I had had that thing done by now and it probably would be square and it would be probably more efficient and it would probably function just the same. But I don't want to build one that way. I want to build it out of this old log cabin and it's taking me a hell of a lot longer. But it's one thing that I want to do. And so I'm giving you all these little examples of weird things that I do in my life. I got an 1800s granary that I bought, salvaged, and moved from being torn down. I want to finish it into living quarters. I'd be much better off, further ahead, probably even financially, if I just built a 20 by 30 little guest house next to my house. But it won't be an 1800s granary restored. And that's just, those are some of the things that I'm into. Those are the things that I think are cool. And the value of them is not necessarily in the idea of the building itself. It's the process of how we got it, where it's been before us, and what we're going to do with it in the future. And that's just another example of blacksmithing. And blacksmithing is just another example of raising a dog. And so if we kind of went into the weeds a little bit. That's a line that my buddy Tony Peterson uses all the time in his podcast. He talks about getting into the weeds. I get into the weeds a lot. This one we got into the weeds quite a bit. Um, but I think the general idea is there. I hope the general idea is there. And I say it because I want to inspire and motivate you guys and I didn't even talk about it, but workshops are coming up. Um, we're going to be putting out some more information on that. Um, we've got this special project that is driven off of past workshops that Ben's been working really hard on, and I'm really excited to share it with you. It's going to be coming soon. I recommend, um, if you're not following us on Facebook, get on YouTube and follow us there. Um, if you are following us on Facebook, you'll see the notifications probably coming up. We're going to share this project through Facebook and YouTube. Um, but it's going to be driven off of workshops. And the whole workshop thing came back to, um, I hope our workshops and I believe our workshops impact people the way the blacksmith class impact me. I think that there are lots of opportunities out there for people to learn a craft, a trade. There's so much opportunity for us to, to learn something and then apply it in our lives. And what better way to do it than with a part of your family members, like a family member within your, your pack, and that's your dog. And, then, and it, you know, it's, it's valuable to get educated before you get the dog. Most people don't. We're not really planners. Uh, we get the dog, and then we get a couple months into it, and then we go, oh, no, lots of issues. I think it's really smart to prepare. I find more and more people these days are preparing for their puppies, but I still, we're always going to run into the ones that have four, five, six month olds that are to that point where they're not cute little puppies anymore. They're becoming little terrors of your house. And what do you do? It is completely salvageable. They are completely moldable puppies, but you're way better off if you coax and correct three steps ahead. If you get this mentality of, hey, easy. If you get this mentality of not creating the problem first to have to fix, coax and correct it in a positive way as opposed to let it go to hell and then try to figure it out how to salvage it. And that's sometimes I think what, what people are running into. So we went a lot longer. Lillian's mobile now. She's got a glove on. She's hitting the camera and the tripod. We're going to call this one a, a day. Uh, that's episode 59. Thank you, you guys, for the support. Um, I hope it makes sense. I think that one was... Here's here Before I end it, that one... Ben's getting nervous. Uh, that one is a podcast that I put off for weeks and told Ben, I want to take better notes on it. I want to be prepared better for it. I have not done that. And we decided we have to do a podcast because we are behind and we got to get one out. And so I said, you know what? I can think about this as much as I want and plan it out as much as I want, or I can just do it. And sometimes we think about and are hesitant to do stuff with our dogs because we're chicken shit and we're afraid to do it. And we just don't do anything. And doing nothing is worse than doing something and making it not perfect and then coaxing and correcting it. And so I decided, let's do that one. 
It's not going to be perfect, but it's better doing it now and getting it done than continually putting it off and getting nothing done. And so we just did it. And I think we got to sometimes have the attitude of it's a fine line in figuring out where we can be in the middle. But if you don't do anything, nothing gets done. If you jump into it with no thought whatsoever, you may find yourself in a little bit deeper than what you expected. If you can somewhat get it fleshed out in your head, get a plan rough to, roughly at a minimum roughly together and then start it. And then I think you can start to dial your plan in as you go. And then you're not only are you getting stuff accomplished, but your your corrections aren't so drastic and dramatic. They're, you're back to this process of understanding there's going to be coaxing and correcting. And it's writing whatever it is that you need write it. So that's it. We did it. We got it done. Uh, we got a couple other podcast ideas that we're going to be work that I've got that we're going to take my own advice and say, you know what, quit trying to perfect it before you do it. Just do it and work your way through it. We're going to do that. Uh, we're also going to stick to some of the questions that people have been asking because we've been getting a lot of them and I have been behind on some of my responses. So thank you all for your patience. Um, I will be getting back to everybody. I will. I do get back to everybody unless it gets missed and that happens occasionally. But I'm telling you, man, the volume of questions and responses and messages and just notes of, hey, this worked for me. Thank you. All those little things mean the world to us, especially as a small company. I thank you for that. I ask if you would do us a favor. Please continue to subscribe, share it with people that you think it would be valuable to and leave us reviews. Um, those are all great ways for us to get an understanding and feedback and also help to try to share this bigger and grow it bigger, which is essentially a snowball effect. It brings in more potential questions and comments that people are struggling with and allows me to help, I hope, more people at once. So thank you guys. Got long. I apologize for that. We'll keep them shorter in the future. Thank you.